Hey, I'm Sean Smith. I'm super excited to be with you guys, coming at you guys live. CF and I so love you guys. I was born and raised in the Bay Area of Oakland, California. I uh, went away to college. I gave my life to Jesus Christ at a secular university. I was rocked by God there. And so that's really my story. I've married a beautiful wife, two beautiful kids. But let us, let's jump in this. If you will, you get ready. I want you to go to Exodus chapter 3. But I just want to say this. We may not ever come this way again. We are on a worldwide reset right now. I think it's so crucial that we understand what is on the table as far as what God wants to do. There are literally drafts on the drawing board of heaven for this next season for you. And so I feel like I have a word that I think will help you navigate this entire season. And so with that, if you'd open up your Bible, Exodus chapter 3, verse 1. Talked about one of my favorite passages. Literally can't wait to dive into this. It says in Exodus chapter 3, verse 1, Now Moses was tending the flock of Jephro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. And he led the flock to the backside of the desert. The NIV says the far side of the desert. And he came to Horeb, the mountain of God. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire from the midst of a bush. So he looked, and behold, the bush was burning with fire, but the bush was not consumed. Then Moses said, I will turn aside and see this great sight, why the bush does not burn. So when the Lord saw that he turned aside to look, God called to him from the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. And he said, here I am. Then he said, do not draw near this place. Take your sandals off your feet, for the place where you stand is holy ground. Moreover, he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face and was afraid to look upon God. And the Lord said, I have surely seen the oppression of my people who are in Egypt. I have heard their cry because of their taskmasters, for I know their sorrows. So I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up from that land to a good and large land, to a land flowing with milk and honey, to the place of the Canaanites, uh, Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, and the Perizzites, the Hivites, the Jebusites, a lot of ites. And so this is this incredible monumental encounter Moses had. I want to break this down. But let's begin right here. I believe that you, the spirit-filled movement, holds the key to worldwide breakthrough. I know we may be looking to the medical community and they are important. We need to pray for them. They're heroes in this session, in this season. But I'm telling you right now, I believe those that hold the key for worldwide breakthrough are you and the spirit-filled movement here in this nation and the nations of the world. Your destiny is to demonstrate the power of God. And the darker it gets in the world around us, because so many people want to say how bad it is. And if you watch the news reports and tell you about how bad it is right now, but let me just say this. The more they talk about how bad it is, the more they present a case for revival to break out. Because revivals never break out on moral high points. They never break out when everything's going great. Revivals historically have always broken out when the bottom falls out, when there's no hope. And I love to say, revivals are most likely when they're least likely. And so these times, I believe, are times that we have to understand this. And here's where we're going to launch. Nobody Nobody holds the kingdom of God hostage. There's nothing out there in that world that can stop the sovereign purposes of God in terms of what he wants to do in you, through you, and beyond you. And you have to believe that. This is so important. Now, here's this passage of Moses at the burning bush. And I think it's so important because here's where it began. I was taking some time praying and saying, God, what are you doing in this season? What is it that's going on? What do you want to say to us? And I felt the strong sense of the Lord that just really impacted my heart. I felt like God was saying, I want to encounter my people in this season in a most unique way. So many people are either in or coming out of this shelter in place. But Psalms 91 says that we can come into the shelter of the Most High God in the secret place. Something happens in that shelter in place than maybe what is happening around the world as others have been sheltered in place. Now, here's the thing about Moses. Moses 
found himself in a place that he never thought he would find himself. He didn't think that he would be on the backside of a desert. Here's this guy. You know the story of Moses, right? You read uh, Exodus. Uh, you've seen the older generation. You've seen the Ten Commandments. The younger generation, you've seen Veggie Tales, right? You have seen and you know about this story of Moses. Moses was a miracle. I mean, in every sense of the word, there was everything supernatural about him being preserved at a time in which Pharaoh was killing male children because he was threatened. And so his mom, Jochebed, by faith, Hebrew says, put him, in a sense, in, in, if you will, just this homemade canoe, right? And sent him down the river Nile. He's rescued by, by at that time, Pharaoh's daughter raises him as his own. He has the biology of a Hebrew. He has the sociology of of an Egyptian, and so God had already fused cultures, but in the midst of it, he felt this desire to be a deliverer. He was called to be a deliverer, and I believe that you could see this in terms of the social justice that's on you, that desire that you want to rescue people from sex trade trafficking. You want to adopt the orphans. You want to build wells in Africa. There's this social justice thing. Uh, Moses had this thing on him. And so one day as he's been raised up and reared in this lap of Egyptian luxury, raised to be the next, perhaps in line, prince of Egypt. He was a prince, but maybe even he could have been promoted from that point. He sees one of his fellow Hebrews being mistreated by an Egyptian guard. And all of a sudden this social justice thing rose up. It's so important that even though you have a social justice thing, just the thought is that you understand that you have to steward your sense of right or wrong based on the calibration of God's word and God's spirit. And if you don't adjust to that recalibration, sometimes you can be in the flesh and we see it. There are people, hey, you've seen it. They've gone on social media tirades. People have done stuff that they later regret it because they do have the social justice thing on, but it hasn't been tempered by the fruits of the spirit. Moses was this guy, right? He sees one of his fellow Hebrews being mistreated. So he rose up, struck the dude, actually kills the dude. And so all of a sudden, if you will, wanted posters go all up over the post offices of Egypt. And this guy has to run. He has to flee for his life. And so here's where he finds himself, the place he never thought he'd be. He'd been on the backside of a wilderness. Think about it. Here's a guy with five books of the Bible inside of him. And the dude is cleaning up sheep poop for his father-in-law in the backside of a desert uh, in, in Midian. And in the midst of this, he's wandering out one day and not knowing what is about to happen to him. But here is the word encounter. Now encounter. Encounters are so important because it is in encounters that God makes himself real to us. We reconnect to our purpose. And in an encounter, God retrofits you with this in weaponry of the supernatural that enables you to walk out your destiny and impact the world the way you were meant to impact the world. Moses would have a burning bush. Let me tell you about my encounter. You know, when I was on the college campus, uh, I was partying. I was in the midst of fraternity that I had pledged and crossed, and we were known as the party animals. I'm doing everything around my campus. I'm caught up in the whole immoral lifestyle. I don't know God. I wasn't raised Christian. Later down the line, my grandmother, I was kind of very much like Timothy in the New Testament, who was raised by his grandmother, his mama. One of them was Eunice. Mine was Ethel. And so very much like Timothy, I'm raised by my mom and grandmother. And someplace in, in high school, my junior year, my grandmother goes to a small Pentecostal hole in the storefront church, gives her life to Christ. She's immediately delivered of decades of alcoholism, comes back to our apartment in West Oakland, California. I see this transformation in the midst of it, my grandmother has an encounter with God that's strong enough to knock addiction off of her, change her life, and everything that began to come out of my grandma's mouth was the word of God, was prophetic. She began to flow in words of knowledge, and so I was exposed to this. So anyway, at this point in time, it got my attention, but it had yet to capture my heart. I go away to, to college. I come back from a night of partying, and suffice it to say, about 3 a.m. in the morning after a night of total partying, partying, revelry, I'm, I'm in a place of total desperation. I cry out to God. God shows up in my room. I see God. I have an encounter. He speaks to me. That encounter launches me. People say, Sean, 
uh, over the years that you, you've impacted some people, you've witnessed and saw some people get saved, you've seen God uh, heal folks. I can attribute all of that back to that initial encounter and encounters that God has given me since because these are what encounters do. Now, let me define a Holy Spirit encounter for you because this is important. Don't you hate it when people talk about stuff and they never define it? So you're kind of like, okay, what do you mean by this? Let me tell you. A Holy Spirit encounter is an extraordinary divine appointment with God's presence and power that radically revolutionizes your life. It refreshes you with strength and results in a new level of passion. I want you to right now take some inventory. How many of you have said right now that you would love to have a new level of passion? You're coming out of maybe a season where you're feeling kind of lethargic. You feel a little apathetic. You feel a little fatigued. You're feeling a little fearful. Encounters put new strength inside of you. And the other thing is it revolutionizes you in strength. Now, let me say this. Encounters are not a bonus accessory to your spiritual walk. They are a necessity. Let me say that again. Holy Ghost encounters are not a bonus kind of extracurricular accessory to have. They're not just a bonus to your spiritual life. They're a necessity. And why is that important? Because divine important uh, encounters are the catalyst for lasting transformation. You know how many people right now want to be transformed? You know how many people are taking master classes or they're getting books or they're going online or they're doing whatever they can to try to get input. They're getting books like, you know, I saw this uh, one uh, book one time and it said, uh, the, the dummy's guide to assertiveness. Excuse me, it was the idiot's guide to assertiveness. And when I saw that book, the idiot's guide to assertiveness, first thing I thought, last person needs to assert themselves is an idiot, okay? First deal with the idiot part, didn't deal with the assertiveness. But seriously though, encounters bring lasting transformation. Encounters answer questions that you didn't even know you needed answers. There are things right now in regards to your purpose. There are things right now you're considering as your mind goes ahead, as you come into the next season, as you come into maybe a conclusion of education part of your life or some of you that are stepping into some more active ministry. Man, encounters give you answers and address the questions, but here is one of the biggest things we need right now. An encounter will launch you into a compelling upgrade in your witness. People are right now searching for anchor points. People feel like the things that they have gotten used to leaning on have all been pulled from them. Many people are gonna come into this next season spinning a bit and they're gonna need the compelling witness. So let me say this, God, as one great minister says, God gives you an encounter so you can become an encounter for the world around you. You owe the world that encounter. I owe the world that encounter. So. In this season, let me repeat this because I've said a lot. God spoke to me and said, I'm going to make myself real to my people so they can showcase my reality to the world around. Now let's go back to Moses. Moses is now 40 years in the backside of the desert. He spent 40 years in Egypt, 40 years in the backside of a desert. The dude is an octogenarian. That means he's 80 years alone. He's been in the back of a desert so long, he looks like Charleston Heston. That would be the dude from the original Ten Commandments. As he's been out in this wilderness season, and maybe some of you feel like you're coming out of a wilderness season, he's lost confidence. Whatever confidence he had before the wilderness, he lost in the midst of the wilderness. And sometimes you go through wilderness seasons and there's confusion that comes. You begin to kind of feel like, I'm coming out of this wilderness season, Sean, and I've lost confidence. I felt like I lost my mojo. I felt like there was a rhythm in my life that got interrupted in the midst of it, kind of who I am. And sometimes it's not just a wilderness season, follow me, but it's a be-wilderness season. That you become bewildered in the midst of that season. You begin to kind of get confused. This was Moses. All of a sudden, he stumbles upon this burning bush. He sees that this bush is on fire, but there's no waste, there's no smoke, there's no ash. And so this thing's supernatural. So he steps into it, and we're going to back up and run over this thing several times. But the moment God speaks to Moses and says, Moses, I want you to go 
tell Pharaoh to let my people go. I want you to be the mouthpiece of literally a national breakthrough. The first thing Moses does is even though he's had this voice of, from heaven, God speaking to him, he begins to question so many different things. And then the first thing he gives is an excuse, right? He says, Lord, I'm slow of speech. He had a speech impediment. He may be stuttering. Now, fast forward this. There's this guy in the New Testament by the name of Stephen. He's actually officially the New Testament's first martyr. He has given his martyr speech as he's standing in front of Sanhedrin and a bunch of Pharisees. And he's before he's going to rebuke them and they ultimately will stone him, he's given them this account, this kind of rundown. And then he stops and says this of Moses as Stephen again. And this is Acts 7, verse 22. Stephen says in his angry speech that would be an epitaph type of speech. He says, Moses, a man mighty in words and in deeds. Now stop. I just got finished telling you about Exodus, right? When we find Moses in Exodus, he's not confident. This dude is not any type of guy that you would look at and hold him up as a high watermark in terms of you're giving a short speech. This is your, I'm checking out of life and checking into eternity speech, and I'm going to stop at Moses, a guy that at this point in Exodus just can't even run a sentence together and feels like all he can do is clean up cheap poo. And yet something happens from that point to just be on this burning bush moment to where a guy, before he checks into eternity, would say, this guy is mighty in word and in deed. And let me submit to you, what was the catalyst that could take you from being insecure, could take you from questioning your calling, your identity, to a point when later down the road, when history and the annals of history are written and made, they speak of you and your generation, and they go, they were mighty in word and in deed. And there's only one thing, this entire passage, the whole reason why I'm talking to you right now is this burning bush. In 2004, on the Discovery Channel, they started this show, and in the midst of this show, it became very popular. It was a derivative of a show that it actually, or a concept that had been used quite a bit in that season. 2004, on the Discovery Channel, there was a show called The Ambush Makeover. Since that time, they have Ambush Makeover 2.0 on the Today Show. But the original, they would have professional stylists and professional makeup clothing people and all of that, they would grab someone, and obviously they were supposedly at that point in time, uh, they had grabbed them and they were not told or briefed before what would happen, but we know how those reality TV moments work. But they would grab a person off the street and they would get someone, obviously they didn't look well, their personal style wasn't good, their makeup wasn't right, hair wasn't right. They would grab them, they would take them into a shop and a personal stylist, hair cutter, makeup artist, all of them, would immediately go to work, and then they would do a quick, it was quick, that's why it's called ambush makeover, and they would show the before and after, and you'd go, oh my God, that's not even the same person. I'll go, mm -hmm. I believe that God has spiritual moments that he was the one that created, and I want to call this, because remember, God revealed himself to Moses as the I am that I am. So he's coming out of a bush, so ready? We're going to put this together. This is Moses' I am bush moment. He's getting an I ambush makeover, and so are you. This happens because God gives us this mighty encounter. Now, think about it. Moses had run to the backside of the desert. He found himself in a place he didn't expect to be. But here is the phrase that I think is so important. I want to give you three keys in closing that I believe will help you have an encounter. Because let me tell you something about encounter. You can't even come to Jesus without an encounter. I had an encounter. That's how I came to know Jesus. I can know, right? I can become a Scientologist, and I could have never met L. Ron Hubbard because it's not a requirement. I can read his Dianetics book. I can know what I need to know, right, and do that. Although if you've seen the expose on that, I don't think you want to do that, and neither did or do I. But you can, you can become a Scientologist and never have an encounter, never met L. Ron Hubbard. He's dead. You wouldn't meet him. But you cannot come to Jesus and be a follower of Christ, a Christian, without an encounter. So your walk with Christ begins with an encounter. But watch this. If you don't have subsequent encounters with Christ, you lose the fruit of your initial encounter. And that's what's happened to a lot of people. We see people whose faith has become shipwrecked. 
And what happened is they had an initial testimony, that initial encounter with God, but it was never followed up by ongoing, significant, real-time connection with God. And as a result of that, they lost the fruit of their initial encounter. And so right now, I believe God, like he did for Moses, Moses, think about it. Moses wasn't really seeking for God in this moment. He said, God sought Moses out. And God is seeking you out right now. Now, here is this thing that I believe is so important as it relates to the thing of a makeover. It says in Exodus 3, verse 1, it says, now Moses. I love that phrase, now. I believe that there are strategic times in God's calendar, that there are moments that it, they aren't like other moments. I don't know what your now Moses moment is. I've had multiple now Sean moments, and I believe that we are having a now us moment right now. But the thing is that you have to lean into those moments to reap the fullness of what God has for you because it's so easy to miss moments. Here's what I love to say. If you don't pivot in pivotal moments, you miss the power of that moment. Let me say that again. If you don't pivot in pivotal moments, you lose the power of that moment. And God has given us right now a very pivotal moment. So let me give you three things that will help you in terms of encounter. Number one, and this is so important, three keys to encounter. We're going to start with number one. Number one, you got to get into proximity. You got to get into proximity. Now, here's what it says in Exodus 3, verse 1. It says, now Moses, and it began to say, he led the flock in the NIV to the far side of the wilderness. Now, think about that for me. In that unique wording, and it goes on to say, he led the flock to the far side of the, the wilderness, Mount Horeb, the Mount of God. And you got to remember, Moses wrote five, the five, first five books of the Bible. But when he is act, this is actually happening, it's real time. So he would write in retrospect, it was Mount Horeb. It was the mountain of God. But launching off in that moment, he didn't know that this would be a meeting place with God. He didn't know this was the mountain of God. What I submit to you is when it says he led the flock, he led the flock to the far side because he was led. Didn't make sense to go to the far side. Why not just feed your flock up close? Feed it in the most, at that point, the most accessible place where they can eat. He couldn't throw them all in the back of a truck that would be his sheep and drive them off. It took a commitment to leave what he was familiar with, to leave what he was accustomed to, to break out of the box of his daily routine. And that's what this past season has been about. It's about getting us in a place where we're willing to go to the far side. We're willing to go beyond our comfort zones. We're willing to go beyond our routines. We're willing to go beyond the opinions of what other people try to say, which the enemy can use other mouthpieces to try to limit you in terms of what God is calling you. I feel like there's an extreme call in your life that is going to demand more out of you in this next season than maybe what you've been used to kind of doing. And I believe there's a hunger that's pressing us to the far side. There's not enough to eat what we've always ate. That's what this thing was about as far as the sheep were concerned. That there must have been something in their appetite that Moses sensed. I got to go to the far side. And so when he goes to the far side, here's what happens. Don't underestimate heaven stirring to launch out further, to not settle for the familiar, to hunger for the more. Because sometimes how God leads you, we want to hear this voluminous voice from heaven that booms with such bass and baritone that there'd be no mistaking it. But sometimes it's just an inner urge. Sometimes it's just a spark, a feeling, a suspicion that God's got more for you than what you currently have been walking in. And it led Moses to go to the far side, to the mount of God. And so what I'm saying is if you want an encounter, you want your burning bush moment, you have to get into proximity, right? Because, hey, I, I get it. We've had more time on our hands, and maybe you've caught up on some of your favorite shows. But what you really want, you can't get off Netflix. You can't get off Hulu. Come on, somebody. You can't get off the Disney Plus channel. What you really want, you're going to have to get on your knees. You're going to find the place. Because if you want more of God, you got to go where God is at. you got to understand. you got to give God space. And maybe that was part of Moses' track of going to the far side of just giving the Lord 
more space. Now, Moses goes to this place. It's been marked out by God for him. But in the midst of all of this, him going to the far side of the desert actually set him up to see and experience what he's about to see. You've come away. You've, you've stepped through some things. You've endured some things. You've held on when others have let go. And you've got to understand there's going to be a reward for your pressing in. If you didn't believe that, let me tell you right now, you're about to get your burning bush experience. So if you want to have a burning bush encounter, three keys. Number one, I told you, and I'll repeat it, you have to get in a proximity. Number two, here's our second point. Listen to me, CF and I. You have to step to the paradox. And here's what I mean by that. When bushes catch on fire, they burn because fire demands fuel. That's why you got to keep throwing more Duraflame logs in your fireplace when it's been cold, right? That's the reason why you got to keep putting gasoline in your tank because it burns the gas. The fire burns the wood. But Moses is seeing a bush that doesn't act like any other bush he has ever seen. It's an unprecedented bush. The bush is on fire, but the bush isn't consumed. The fire carries its own fuel. And, and, and this didn't make sense because it was supernatural. And if you're going to have an encounter with God, a fresh burning bush moment, you got to step to the paradox. What do you mean by that? You have to move past intellectual Christianity into experiential Christianity. So many people have a Christianity of their intellect. So many people have a, a Christianity that is solely based on what they can think through, what is rational to them, what is logical to them. And if all you have is a logical God of someone you can figure out, I'm going to be straight with you. Let go of that God, because that God is not the God, Yahweh, El Shaddai, Adonai. That is a God of your imagination. That's a figment of your imagination, because his ways are past finding out. And so here is this burning bush that is a paradigm buster. It's something inexplainable, inexplicable, challenging his current understanding. And you got to understand, the blueprint of the Bible is that the supernatural is the norm. Maybe part of this kind of a Holy Ghost control all the delete that God has put on the world in terms of that, that would be what you do to reboot something. In terms of this history rendering reboot, maybe one of the things that God is doing is he's saying, I want you to have a supernatural walk. So whatever you've got accustomed to, I want you to now reach beyond that and experience by faith something beyond what you've had. And this, I believe, is the blueprint of the Bible. Now, when Moses saw the bush, all the ground rules that he thought were the ground rules were no longer the ground rules at this point. When he saw the bush, the bush didn't behave as all bushes have behaved throughout history. This is not your normal bush. This bush didn't make sense. And so what does Moses do is Moses is on the brink of an encounter. So now let me break it down. You know you're on the brink of an encounter, a burning bush moment when God shows you a contradiction. Because remember, bush on fire but not being consumed, that's a contradiction. Maybe right now you have a promise that God's giving you. You don't see. You see contrary circumstances to the promise that God has given you. Maybe you've been praying for a help condition in terms of someone getting healed. Maybe you've been praying for a loved one to come back to Christ. Maybe you've been praying about an issue of your own heart. And what you're currently seeing right now is the opposite of what you believe God has spoken to you. Let me encourage you and say, when God shows you a contradiction, come on somebody. When God shows you a contradiction, you're on the brink of your burning bush moment. Why? Because God allows contradiction so you would lean not to your own understanding, but rather you would trust in the Lord. And as you step out, that becomes the on-ramp into the supernatural. I love to say it this way. A non-supernatural gospel is not good news. It's inferior news. It's the news that they can give you on 5 o'clock on your local news channel. But the good news is about the supernatural. And the supernatural is past your intellect. Let me tell you what God wants to do in this season. God wants mystery to spill into your history. Oh, man, I'm about to get excited right now. God wants mystery. The Bible talks about the letter of Corinth. Let a man so consider us 
servants of the Most High God, so we're to serve, but then it says this phrase, that's mystery. The Bible talks about the letter of Corinth, let a man so consider us. Servants of the Most High God, so we're to serve, but then it says this phrase, stewards of the mysteries of God. When Paul concisely compacts what Christianity ought to look like, he says we ought to be servants of the Most High God, and we ought to be stewards of the mysteries of God. Servants, stewards of the mysteries of God. And this is what he's talking about right here. Now, the third thing that I want to tell you, because I feel like this is so important. The third thing, I, I told you number one, let me review our points. Get in a proximity. Number two, you have to step into the paradox. And number three, and I think this is as important as any of them, you have to embrace the purge. Embrace the purge. Now, why is this important? Now, it says that Moses saw the burning bush, the established. He went to the far side of the desert, sees a bush on fire. When he sees the bush, he embraces the contradiction. He embraces, you know, the paradox, step to the paradox. And when he did it, the Bible says he turned aside. Now, why is this important? Because this is the segue to this whole thing about embrace the purge, is that part of this season is about consecration. Part of this season is about maybe the miracle from heaven was not the bush. Angels are not, I think, sitting around going, whoa, a bush is on fire. Like the Godhead is not sitting back like, wow, look at what we just did. A bush is on fire, but it's not burning. Why? Because miracles and the supernatural are natural to heaven. The glory has a different ecosystem than the rules of earth. It would be like you and I being super excited that somebody sneezed. Oh man, check out that sneeze. Wasn't that awesome? No, it's just natural. We sneeze. Maybe the thing that made angels' jaws drop wasn't that there was a bush that wasn't consumed by fire, but maybe the miracle that was the pivot in the pivotal moment, because by definition of pivot, this is what Moses did, says he turned aside. Maybe the miracle for you is you turn aside, that they say one third of our time is spent on internet, smartphone, or computer, or in front of some form of entertainment, that we're spending that much. And I believe that's actually a low figure, a low number. What if all of a sudden we turn some of that off to turn aside and look to God? If you want an encounter, you're going to have to have turn aside moments. You're going to have to say, you know what? I, I normally would allow this to consume my, my attention, but right now I'm going to turn aside and ask God, Lord, I'm going to spend time with you. There's something about waiting on Holy Spirit that honors him, that causes him to reveal. His job description is to take that which is of the Father and reveal it to us. So here's this embrace the purge. When Moses turned towards the fire, he heard his name called. I forgot it was, I think it was one philosopher that says the greatest words anyone would ever hear, no matter what language, no matter what culture, the greatest words anyone ever hears is their name. You imagine, they say, experts tell us that up to this point of the burning bush moment, and this blew me away. Are you ready for this? Scholars say it had been 400 years since anyone had heard God's voice. That's the reason why Moses is going, How they, why they, should they believe that God spoke to them? Because it had been silent. Something about sometimes seasons of silence actually set you up in the midst of that for the sounds of heaven to begin to come in abundance. And so the silence led to the sound. And he hears his, his name called Moses, Moses. Could he have missed it? Sure he could have missed it. Had he not turned aside, he would have never got that. God waited to see that he turned aside. Then he called his name. God knows your name. He knows your circumstances. He knows your, your lack. He knows your insecurity. He knows the thing that's broke your heart. God knows that. He's an intimate God. He's well aware of these things. And in that moment, God says to Moses, Moses, take off your sandals. Now, isn't that an odd thing to say? Of all the things, you get first two words that come out of the Lord's mouth is your name, Moses, Moses. Next thing, take off your sandals. And then, of course, the place for sandals on the ground. I have a friend who ironically graduated as well, not only from the university I was at, but he graduated afterwards. He went to see up and on. And a great, great friend of mine to this day. He's a Japanese-American. I remember back when we were in college together and he'd given his life to the Lord. Uh, he said, hey, Sean, I'm going home. Man, this weekend, what are you doing? Would you like to come? I go, sure. You know, you're in college. So I went home with them. 
and he lived in the Bay Area, not too far from where I grew up. And so I went over his house, and his, in that sense, his family were, were more traditional in terms of Japanese culture. And so we got to his house, I noticed my friend took off his shoes. He took off his shoes, and they left the front door. There was a pile of shoes on the front door. And so without him even telling me, you know, hey, I took off my shoes, and I put it in the front door, even though it was very counterintuitive to me, because you got to understand, my brother grew up in West Oakland, and you left your shoes in the front door. When you came back, your shoes might be gone, okay? But anyway, we took it off. Now, why did we take off our shoes? Now, I think that the logistics of this is pretty right out there. It's pretty obvious. She wasn't rejecting shoes, my friend's mom. Their family wasn't rejecting shoes and saying, we don't want shoes. What they were rejecting was the dirt on the bottom of your shoes. And if they didn't have a place, you, you know, again, if they're not going to wash your shoes on the front door, what they're saying is, I don't reject your shoes. I reject the dirt on your shoes. And so you need to get the shoes off and leave the dirt at the door. I feel like in this season of you're wanting a fresh encounter with God, God wants to give you this burning bush moment. God is saying, you got to leave the dirt at the door. That if you want to come into a deeper place in me, there are issues of the heart. And, and I'm telling you, it, 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 and, and I want to say this, as, as sensitive and as grace-filled as I possibly can. If this season is past and you've not repented of something, you're not listening. I want to go deeper in that, right? Because I can feel that amens on that. If you got through this season and you've not repented, you've not been weaned of something in terms of the world, you've not had to take thought captive, You've not said, oh, God, you know what? I see this thing in my heart. It's not right. Oh, Lord, forgive me. You've not done it. You've missed the moment of this season. This season is about embracing the purge. This is about leaving your shoes at the front door. Let God deal with the dirt in your heart. They would tell us that the whole concept of sandals at this stage in history, Moses would have learned that from the Egyptians because slaves didn't have sandals. They were barefooted. And so maybe even the whole concept of him wearing sandals was something Egypt, in terms of their understanding that you are royalty and that royal people go where they want to go, that what God is saying is, Moses, I got to get Egypt off you so I can send you back into Egypt to break Egypt's power over everyone else that you're called to release. And maybe that's what it is. Maybe in this season, God just needs to, you know what Egypt is, right? It's, just, it's a type of the world. It signifies, represents the spirit of the world. And maybe God in this season is saying, I got to get Egypt off you. I got to get the world off you if you want a deeper place of encounter. How many of you want to hear the voice of God clear? How many of you want to have a more intimate connection with Jesus? How many of you want what God's put inside of you to impact the world around you? Well, I'm telling you, your ambush, the I ambush makeover is already beginning for you. Now, this incredible moment all came to this point right here. I believe that God lights revival fires in people's hearts. And let me say something, and please hear this. I believe he's lit revival fires all over the world, but after a short time, the fire dies down to a trickle. Why? Because we lack the commitment to take our sandals off, to deal with the dirt. And again, people of royalty that decided what they were going to do, right? They were independent of authority because they were the authority. They were the ones with sandals. So what God is saying is that if you want to live your life independent of me and not come under my lordship and not deal with the dirt, whatever I would do in your heart would be short-lived because you haven't given the correct atmosphere for the fire of the burning bush to burn. Now, God in this moment turned this unimportant bush into a historical object. Now, final thing I'm going to say, and we're going to pray. I love this. You ready for this? When Moses was looking at the burning bush, he was really looking at a prophetic picture of himself. They said that bush was an acacia bush that could be found any place in the backside of that desert. There were thousands, maybe even tens of thousands of bushes. Moses walked past those bushes for 40 years every day, didn't think twice. But there's something different when you get fire on the bush. Your life may have felt ordinary. You may feel like, hey, what's the thing that would distinguish me from anyone else? After all, that was Moses' question. And the difference is, God is saying, I'm holding a mirror to you, Moses. 
This is an ordinary bush, but it isn't ordinary when he gets God's fire on it. When he gets God's fire on the bush, what was ordinary becomes extraordinary, and we know the rest, because history was made. One man literally became God's solution to break open, at that time, the strongest military might, armed to the gills nation, a civilization on the planet were the Egyptians, and God used one man and a stick he had literally to break the oppression of people. And so what am I saying? When Jesus said, oh, I long to bring fire to the earth, and I wish it, I long to send fire to the earth, and I wish it was already here. And of course, in Acts chapter 2, that's when fire came. So what does that whole thing tell us? You are the fire that God is sending to ignite the earth. Your burning bush moment begins now. Any moment you decide, God, I'm willing to go and get in proximity. I'm willing to step into the paradox. Another way of saying the things I can't explain, I want what I can't explain. I don't want a predictable experience. I want the unprecedented of God in my life. The things that I've never seen, never experienced, I want the more. And then finally, you're willing to embrace the purge. You're willing to get right. You're willing to repent. Come on, somebody, that word has got to come back. Right? we got to bring back because there's been no revivals without repentance. We've got to be people that say, hey, my heart has got to get right. And maybe whatever you were before, let's say two months ago, whatever it was that you were before as a believer, let's emerge out of this kind of like Moses and saying this burning bush encounter changed our life. So I just want to pray with you right now. And wherever you're at right now, I just want you to say, Lord, I hunger for a fresh encounter with you. Lord, I am ready for the I am bush makeover. God, what I need cannot be found in popularity, nor followers on social media. It cannot be found in some uh, uh, binge watch. No, hey, no, no legalism there. But what I want can only be found in you. And so, Lord, I'm praying right now. Father, I just pray for those that are, that are watching, that are taking this in right now. I just pray, God, that you would literally unwrap to them the encounter realm. I believe there's a realm of encounter. I believe you would open that realm. The God, that there are many people that are sheltered in place, but there's a shelter of the Most High that we're desiring to come into. I pray, God, that the supernatural glory of the Lord would begin to hit folks when they're in their bedrooms, when they're in their cars, when they're in their showers, when they're doing their daily stuff. I'm asking God right now that, God, you said you pour water on them that are thirsty. Give us an unprecedented thirst that would lead to an unprecedented outpouring. And I pray you would ignite hearts. Father, I pray you would deal with the dead spots in my heart. And I feel like I'm speaking to someone I, uh, because of a hurt, because of a disappointment, because of what someone did when they betrayed you. I just pray God will give you the dead places of a heart. And God, just like Moses, that moment, there were some regrets and there were some resentments, but he gave it all up in this moment of conflagration, which is another sophisticated word of being fired up. And Lord, I thank you that the love of God, the love of God is what draws us in. Because your love demands demonstration. And because of that, God, I thank you, God, that you're a demo, God, that you demonstrate. And so, Lord, I pray that, and I pray more grace in the secret place, and you be ready, because this encounter is going to launch you toward the greatest witness. So get your boldness back on. Get your confidence. Square your shoulders. You are people of purpose. And I just want you to know that I love you. Again, this is Sean Smith. God bless.